Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Light of orthodoxy, pillar and teacher of the church, adornment of monastics, invincible champions of theologians. O Gregory, you wonder worker, boast of Thessalonica, Herald of grace, ever pray that our souls be saved. Let us pray to the Lord, Lord of mercy. God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who have raised us up from our beds and gathered us together for this hour of prayer, give us grace by the opening of our mouths and accept our thanksgivings in the measure of our ability. Teach us your statutes because we do not know how to pray as we should, unless you, O Lord, guide us by your Holy Spirit. Therefore we beg you, if we have sinned in any way until the present hour, in word or deed or by thought, voluntarily or involuntarily, remit, forgive, and pardon. For if you should regard iniquities, O Lord, who will stand? For there is redemption from you. For you only are a, a holy, a, might, a helper, and a mighty defender of our life, and in you is our praise at all times. For blessed and glorified is the kingdom of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Now and ever into the ages of ages, amen. My hope is the Father, my refuge is the Son, my protection, the Holy Spirit, Holy Trinity, glory to you. I place all my hope in you, Mother of God, keep me under protection. Please be seated. Welcome. Welcome, everyone. Believe it or not, this is our seventh meeting of the year. So after this, we only have two left. So we're getting down to the tail portion of the Divine Liturgy. Let's do a quick recap from our last session so that we can get back up to speed and then we'll move forward. We have a lot to unpack today, so we need to get moving. So last month, we talked about the section of the liturgy between the great entrance and the anaphora, which today we'll talk about the anaphora and what that means and what that is. So first, there's a set of petitions called the plirotika. These are the petitions of completion. And it's in these petitions that we ask that God makes us worthy to offer the Eucharist, the sacrifice of the Eucharist. So in that, in that portion, we ask to be worthy to offer. And, and today we'll see that in the Anaphora, we make the offering. Second, we talked about the ancient rite of the kiss of peace, uh, which was a sign of Christian love and unity that was done at every Christian gathering. Not even, at, not even in worship, but every time Christians got together, they shared the so-called kiss of peace. And we shared the story of the Russian priests who, before their execution by the communists, exchanged the kiss of peace together before their martyrdoms. We discussed also the priest saying, the doors, the doors, or the deacon, if the deacon is here. In former times, the doors of the church would be locked at this time, would be closed and locked. And this was for protection from uh, attack because the church was persecuted for many years. And now, unfortunately, we've seen the church is again in persecution in certain parts of the world. St. Nicholas Cavasilas, which we talked about last time too, he also offers a different explanation, which is that calling to open our hearts, open the doors of our hearts during the liturgy so that we can be present and attentive in the presence of God. And last, we discussed the creed. And we talked about how the creed was the church's official response to the heresies of the 4th century. And it's been used in our churches since about the 6th century in the liturgy. And we still use it even today as a defense against heresy. Why? Because if you wish to be part of the body of Christ, you have to believe what the body of Christ says about Christ, the true Christ. We have to believe in the true Christ and in the Gospels. So we must worship the real Jesus in order to be a full member of the body of Christ. So now we move forward into the anaphora. Anaphora in Greek means offering. 
So in this section of the liturgy, in this prayer of the liturgy, we are making the offering to God. The offering has been prepared. We have prayed, the priests have prayed to be worthy to offer it. We've prayed for the people to be worthy to offer it and to receive the offering in return. And now we are, is the time for the offering to actually happen. One thing that we probably don't realize about this section of the liturgy, and we'll see it as we go through each line by line we'll go through today, is that it's actually one prayer. So from after, uh, so from the, when the priest says, let us stand well, let us stand in awe, Actually, I should say, when the priest reads the prayer, it is proper and right to hymn you. From that, all the way to that we may be granted with one voice and one heart to praise and glorify your honorable and majestic name. It's one long prayer that's broken up by exclamations of the people. In my research, I found that it's almost as if the people cannot contain themselves throughout the duration of the prayer. So with the, the exclamations and the the hymns and all those things were added, but that does not take away from the fact that it's one continuous prayer, and we'll see that today as we go through it. So, uh, there's a story. So, through this prayer, the, uh, through the prayer of the Anaphora, we encounter the living God. We come in contact with Him. In the writings of St. Simeon, the New Theologian, which is actually one of the saints that we commemorate today, we find this story. And St. Simeon now is talking. He says, I heard of a certain monk priest who revealed to me that, and this is now, he's quoting the other monk. I had never served, this is in your quote packet, by the way. I had never served the liturgy without seeing the Holy Spirit. I saw it coming to me during my ordination to the priesthood by the archpriest, and also while he was saying the prayer with the prayer book resting on my wretched head. And now St. Simeon is talking again. I asked him how it was when he had seen it during his ordination. So St. Simeon is asking, oh, what was the Holy Spirit like? How, how was it when you saw the Holy Spirit? And the monk responds, It was simple and shapeless, without form, yet in the form of light. While I was in a state of wonder, it, being the Holy Spirit, was telling me in a mystical way, In this way I come to all the prophets and apostles and saints, and to God's chosen people, wherever they may be found nowadays, and especially in holy worship, as well as during all the mysteries of the church. For I am God's Holy Spirit. To Him be glory and dominion forever. Amen. And we'll see later on that one of the things that is prayed for specifically during the Anaphora is for the Holy Spirit to come down and change the bread and the wine into the body and blood of Christ. So whenever we enter this part of the liturgy, this is what we're preparing for. We're preparing to literally come into contact with the divine. Okay, so now let's go start going through it. There's an opening exchange just before the Anaphora prayers from where we left off. So the priest begins with this little exchange between the priest and the people. And it's an exchange of mutual encouragement. It's almost like the priest is encouraging the people and the people are in response encouraging the priest as well. So the priest says, let us stand well, let us stand in awe. And you can follow along. If you have liturgy books, you can follow along well. If not, there's more liturgy books here on the side if you would like to follow along as well. So the priest says, let us stand well, let us stand in awe. Let us be attentive that we may present the holy offering in peace. In other words, what the priest is saying is the time has come. Stand and be attentive. The king is in our midst. Then he offers the following blessing to the people. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God the Father and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with all of you. And St. Nicholas Cavasilas, who's one of our favorite saints for the liturgy, uh, his commentary, explains that in this prayer, the priest is asking for each person of the Trinity, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, to give us their special gift. So grace, uh, grace from the Son Love from the Father and fellowship from the Holy Spirit. And there's a beautiful quote of his in your packet. It says, For the Son gave himself as Savior to us, who not only had bestowed nothing upon him, but also were already in his debt. For for while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. His care of us then is in the trust, in the truest sense, a grace. In other words, we never did anything for Christ. And we owed Christ, and yet still he came and sacrificed on our behalf. 
And that is what we call grace, receiving a gift when we are not deserving, deserving of it. He continues, The Father, through the sufferings of His Son, was reconciled to mankind and showered His love upon His enemies, so that His goodness to us is given the name of love. So the Father gives us His love. That's His special gift to humanity. Finally, the being rich in mercy, which to give his, wished to give his enemies who had now become his friends the best of himself. And this the Holy Spirit achieved when he descended upon the apostles. That is why his goodness to men is called fellowship. So the Holy Spirit is what unifies us and brings us in fellowship with one another. As we saw on the Feast of Pentecost, when the church was established, it was the Holy Spirit that came down and brought all of the believers together. So the people returned this blessing by saying to the priest, and with your spirit. And here we can see the dual encouragement. Priest encouraging people, people encouraging the priest. Then the priest calls on the people saying, let us lift up our hearts. In other words, put your hearts and mind in heaven with Christ and do not leave them here on earth any longer. The people to this respond, we lift them up unto the Lord. The priest then calls the people to give thanks unto the Lord. To which the people respond, it is proper and right. And so with this exchange completed, we come to the beginning of the anaphora, the beginning of the offering and the sacrifice. So, the priest starts reading the prayer, and I'll read it for you. It is proper and right to him you, to bless you, to praise you, to give thanks to you, and to worship you in every place of your dominion. For you, O God, are ineffable, inconceivable, invisible, incomprehensible, existing forever and forever the same, you and your only begotten Son and your Holy Spirit. You brought us out of nothing into being, and when we had fallen away, you raised us up again. You left nothing undone until you had led us up to heaven and granted us your kingdom which is to come. For all these things we thank you and your only begotten Son and your Holy Spirit, for all things we know and do not know, for blessings manifest and hidden, that have been bestowed on us. We thank you also for this liturgy, which you have deigned to receive from our hands, even though thousands of archangels and tens of thousands of angels stand around you, the cherubim and seraphim, six-winged, many-eyed, soaring aloft on their wings. So we see in this prayer, the beginning of the Anaphora prayer, the nature of the sacrifice. What are we offering to God? We are offering Him our thanks for everything that He has done for us. And really, when we think about it, what do we, can we offer God that He hasn't given to us already? Father Lawrence Farley, and this is a quote in your packet as well, puts it in this way. In this sacrifice, we have nothing of our own to offer our God. He has done it all. He owns even the gifts of bread and wine that we offer to Him. For He has produced them as the Creator, causing grain to grow for bread, causing grapes to grow for wine. As sinners and debtors to divine grace, we have nothing to offer God but our praise, our gratitude, thanking Him for all His divine and saving acts, both past and future. And it makes sense then that we call the divine liturgy, we call Holy Communion the Eucharist. Of course, Eucharist is, comes from the Greek word uh, ephkaristia, which means thanksgiving. So in our offering to God, we are offering our thanks. And in, in this offering of thanks, we become human. This is our role as humanity in our relationship with God. It makes us human. That it fulfills our potential as people in the eyes of God. In the late words of Father Alexander Schmemann, who was a 20th century saint who lived here in America, and this was, I thought was a beautiful quote. I wanted, really wanted to include it. It says, Everyone capable of thanksgiving is capable of salvation and eternal joy. So even if that's the only thing we can do is give our thanks to God, then we have the ability to embrace our salvation. So, at the end of this first part of the Anaphora prayer, the priest thanks God for accepting our gifts, even though he is surrounded by the armies of angels and archangels, who are constantly singing, exclaiming, proclaiming the triumphal hymn, and saying, Holy, holy, holy Lord Sabaoth, heaven and earth are filled with your glory. Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. And we can start to see what I was talking about, how this is one continual prayer. The opening portion of it feeds directly into the exclamation, where he, the priest says, 
singing the victory hymn, proclaiming, crying out, and saying. It feeds directly into it. And that feeds directly into Holy, Holy, Holy Lord Sabaoth, which is sung by all the people. So when we, so why do, why do we, why is the priest comparing our gifts to the gifts of the angels? When we do that, we see that our simple offering, our humble offering, uh, is really nothing special. At the end of the day, it's bread and wine. We can go to the store and buy bread and wine whenever we want. And yet, even so, God accepts it lovingly. He loves that we offer this gift to Him. And He has directed us to offer this gift to Him. Father Anthony Canaris explains that it's like a child who on his mother's birthday goes out in the backyard and picks a dandelion and comes inside and offers it to his mother. Well, how does the mother react? Is she disgusted by the dandelion? No. How does the mother react? She's joyfully. She receives even this little weed. It's not even a real flower. It's a weed. With complete joy and happiness. Because the child has thought of her and is remembering her and in a way is thanking her the same way that we offer bread and wine. God doesn't need the bread and wine, but still, it's our way of offering ourselves and our thanks to God. And we'll get into that a little bit more later. So when the priest says the exclamation, singing, exclaiming, and proclaiming, he's referring again to the angels. And this hymn that is sung by the people, Holy, 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 Lord Sabaoth, heaven and earth are filled with your glory, is the hymn of the angels, which we find in the Bible, specifically in the book of Isaiah. We talked about this a little bit when we were talking about the Trisagion hymn, the thrice holy hymn, and how the structure for that hymn comes from this hymn from Isaiah, the vision of Isaiah. So just to refresh our memories, Isaiah has a vision of God. And he sees the temple filled with smoke. And the throne of God is in the middle, and around it are flying thousands of angels. And what does he hear them saying? Holy, holy, holy Lord Sabaoth, heaven and earth are filled with your glory. So these words that we chant during the liturgy are the exact words that the angels sing at the throne of God. Saint Germanos, who's another one of our favorite saints in terms of the liturgy, he explains that just as in Isaiah's vision, where an angel brings Isaiah a burning coal, Isaiah sees an angel come to him with a burning coal and touches his mouth with it. And this is to show that the God is giving him the gift of prophecy. In the same way, now the priest will bring God's gift of his body and blood in, in his own hands. So the priest then is becoming like the angel in the vision, bringing the body and blood to the people. Instead of the coal, we have the body and blood. Instead of the tongs that the angel is holding the coal, the priest has his hands. In the prayer that continues now, after this hymn, we see that even though we don't compare to the voices of the angels, I don't think anybody can claim to have a truly angelic voice and to offer gifts like the angels can, but even though we don't compare with them, we still unite ourselves with the angels. We kind of piggyback on what they do in the praise of God. So the priest now continues the anaphora. He says, together with these blessed powers, Master, who loves mankind, meaning together with the angels, we also exclaim and say, holy are you and most holy, you and your only begotten Son and your Holy Spirit. Holy are you and most holy, and sublime is your glory. Now we're offering our praise with the angels. You so loved your world that you gave your only begotten Son, so that everyone who believes in him should not perish, but have eternal life. And this comes, of course, from the Gospel of John 3.16. When he had come and fulfilled for our sake the entire plan of salvation, on the night in which he was delivered up, or rather when he delivered himself up for the life of the world, he took bread in his holy, pure, and blameless hands, and giving thanks and blessing, he hallowed and broke it, and gave it to his holy disciples and apostles, saying, and that's where the silent prayer stops. So in this portion of the anaphora, we praise God. Holy are you and most holy. Holy are you and most holy. And we thank him again, this time specifically for Christ, for the actions that Christ did on our behalf and for our salvation. The passion, the cross, the resurrection, and for instituting for us Holy Communion. Now, we get down to the... So, so to speak, the business end of the anaphora. 
So we've come now to the consecration. Remember the priest in the last portion of the prayer, he leaves off by saying, he hallowed and broke it and gave it to his holy disciples and apostles, saying, what does he say? That's the next exclamation. The, pr the priest uses the same words that Christ says in the Gospels at the Last Supper. Take, eat. This is my body which is broken for you for the remission of sins. So when the priest says this, again, he's continuing the prayer. It's, it's still part of the prayer. And likewise, after partaking of the supper, he took the cup saying, Drink of this, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant, which is shed for you and for many for the remission of sins. You may, we may wonder, why do we use the exact words? Nor uh, very few times in the liturgy and in our worship do we use the exact words from the Bible. There's a few instances. But, so why do we use these exact words? It's not theatrics. We're not putting on a play to reenact, so to speak, the mystical supper, the Last Supper. We ha it's because Christ, in these words, gives us the authority to offer the sacrifice. He says, do this in remembrance of me. So when we say these words, in other words, we're saying, Christ, you have given us the authority to be here today and to offer you the bread and the wine to be transformed. The words of the Last Supper should also make us think about, remember, and even become present again at the Last Supper itself. It's almost like we're in the upper room with Christ and his disciples. It's in this same sense of remembrance, which in Greek is anamnesis, in this same sense of remembrance and being present in these events, uh, that the priest continues the anaphora, saying, Remembering, therefore, this saving commandment and all that has been done for our sake, the cross, the tomb, the resurrection on the third day, the ascension into heaven, the enthronement at the right hand, and the second and glorious coming again. So we remember not only the mystical supper, we remember everything that Christ did for us. The whole passion, his whole life, uh, his coming as a man, his passion, his crucifixion, as we said, the resurrection, his ascension, even the sending of the Holy Spirit, and even the second coming, which hasn't happened yet in our history, but in eternity uh, is happening even now. We remember, excuse me, so it is in this mentality of remembering, in this mentality of anamnesis, of being present again in these events, that we make the offering. So we don't make the offering only as today, March 12, 2017. We, remember, we make the offering as part of eternity. We're entering almost into this state of eternity, into heaven itself, being present even at events that took place 2,000 years ago. Now the priest lifts up the gifts and he says, Your own of your own we offer to you in all and for all. And what is our offer? We said earlier, thanks. And the only, th really, the only things that are offered on the altar table are things that God has already given us. Bread and bread, uh, excuse me, that God has already given us. Bread and wine are not our own production. We can't make wheat and grapes in a factory, although maybe one day we can. I hope not, but maybe one day we will be able to. Um, but God offers those things to us so that we can make them into bread and wine, so that we can sustain ourselves and so that we can offer them back to him, so that they can be transformed in a heavenly way. So the priest continues with the anaphora. As you can see, it's just a continuation. It's one long, continuous prayer. He continues, Once again we offer to you this spiritual worship without the shedding of blood, and we beseech and pray and entreat you. Send down your Holy Spirit upon us and upon, upon the gifts here presented. And make this bread the precious body of your Christ. And as he says that, he makes the sign of the cross over the paten. And that which is in this cup, the precious blood of your Christ. And he makes the sign of the cross over the chalice. Changing them by your Holy Spirit. And he makes a big cross over the whole hantimension with everything on it. And then we, the people should respond or whoever is nearby should respond by saying, Amin, Amin, Amin. Now this is what we call the epiklesis. Epiklesis in Greek means calling upon. And who are we calling upon? You're calling upon the Holy Spirit to come down, to descend from heaven, and to transform the bread and the wine into the true body and blood of our Lord. In the words of St. Cyril of Jerusalem, his beautiful words of his, whatever comes in contact with the Holy Spirit 
is sanctified and changed. Whatever comes in contact with the Holy Spirit is sanctified and changed. And so, just as St. Nicholas Cavasilas explains, and this is also in your, your quote sheet, for it is no longer the bread which until now has represented the Lord's body, nor is it a simple offering. It is the true victim, the most holy body of the Lord, which really suffered the outrages, the insults, the blows, which was crucified and slain, which under Pontius Pilate bore such splendid witness, that body which was mocked, scourged, spat upon, and which tasted gall. In like manner, the wine has become the blood which flowed from that body. It is that body and blood formed by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, which was buried, which rose again on the third day, which ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of the Father. So this transformation that takes place in the liturgy is not symbolism. It's not, uh, like I said earlier, it's not theatrics. It is a true transformation. The bread and the wine become Christ's true body and his true blood. So what we have in front of us is just that, Christ himself. We are in the presence, at this point, we are in the presence of God. The Anaphora continues. So now we left off, we left off with changing them by your Holy Spirit. So that they may be for those who partake of them, for vigilance of soul, remission of sins, communion of your Holy Spirit, fullness of the kingdom of heaven, boldness before you, not for judgment or condemnation. So in these lines of the Anaphora, we hear what are the effects, what are the benefits for us of participating in the mysteries. It is as, it is, is, it is as Christ says, He who eats my flesh and drinks my blood abides in me and I in him. That's John chapter 6, 54. When we receive Holy Communion, now that the body and blood is in front of us, we experience the fullness of the kingdom of heaven in our own hearts. And we experience the remission of sins, all these things that we prayed for here. Vigilance of soul, remission of sins, communion of the Holy Spirit, fullness of the kingdom of heaven. The priest continues in the next few lines of the Anaphora and says, Again, we offer you this spiritual worship for those who have reposed in the faith, forefathers, fathers, patriarchs, prophets, apostles, preachers, evangelists, martyrs, confessors, ascetics, and for every righteous spirit made perfect in faith. So not only do we offer our thanks to God for all that he personally did for us in his earthly life, but we also thank God in the next line of the Anaphora for the Panagia and for all the saints. When the priest says, especially for our most holy, pure, blessed, and glorious lady, the Theotokos and ever Virgin Mary. So again, the Anaphora is just continuing right along. We offer thanks for all these martyrs, confessors, ascetics, and for every righteous spirit made perfect in faith, and especially for our most holy, pure, blessed, and glorious lady, the Theotokos and ever Virgin Mary. Why do we offer thanks for the Panagia and for the saints? Because, first of all, for the Panagia, we talked about this earlier when we talked about the antiphons and about Tespresvias uh, Theotoku. But we thank the, the Lord for giving us the Panagia because she's our intercessor. She's the one sitting at God's throne who pleads on our behalf and begs for God to have mercy on us. She brought Christ into the world as a man. And by thanking the Holy Virgin, we complete our thanks to God. Thanking God and thanking the Panagia are like one and the same. Not to confuse that the Panagia is God, but when we offer our thanks to the Virgin Mary, she is immediately passing those thanks to the Lord at his throne. In the words of St. Irenaeus of Lyon, what the Virgin Eve, so now he's referring to Genesis, what the Virgin Eve tied up by unbelief, meaning humanity was made captive to death by Eve's sin, the Virgin Mary loosed by faith. So whatever Eve and Adam, may, uh, whatever chaos they created in their sin, the Virgin Mary undoes by her faithfulness. So in other words, she is an agent for our salvation. We also offer our thanks to God for his saints, and we pray for the souls of our forefathers who have gone before us. We commemorate the saints and we honor the saints and we thank God for the saints. And we see there's, we're surrounded here by icons of the saints as well. Because the saints are the testament. They are the proof that God's promise will be given to all those who faithfully follow him in this life. 
The saints are saints because they lived the true and authentic Christian life. And so we have them as our proof that if we also follow that life, we will be glorified by God and we will be placed in his heavenly kingdom. And so we thank God for giving them as examples and for that testimony and that encouragement to, to give us the strength to go on even when being a Christian is very difficult. It is, as if, it, it is if, as if we are saying, give us the grace which you have already given to your saints. Sanctify us as you have already sanctified so many of our race. So when we receive this grace, however, whether we receive this grace, I should say, depends on us. God offers his grace freely, but he will not force feed his grace down our throats. It is our choice whether to live the life or whether to not live the life. And God respects our freedom and our right to choose that. St. Nicholas Cavasilas explains, and this is in your packet as well, the working of grace within us demands our cooperation. And as a result, our negligence can impede it. In other words, grace will sanctify us through the sacred offerings if it finds us worthy, if it finds us ready and fit for sanctification. If it should, on the other hand, find us unprepared, not only do we reap no benefit, but we suffer grave harm and loss. So we have to make sure that we're putting in the effort to be authentic Christians every day of our lives. And even when we fall short of that, which we all do, of course, to be living the life of repentance, to constantly be in repentance and confession, offering our sins and our brokenness to the Lord, which is how we are healed. If we, so if we don't do that, we stay broken forever and ever. So, let us take care then, when we do approach the Holy Chalice, that we do it in the right spirit, with the right mentality. We have to do it with a willingness to let God transform us, to let God transform our lives and make us the people that He wants us to become, not make us the people that we want to become. Otherwise, we receive the gifts selfishly, wanting God to give us His blessings without putting any effort on our part. So our relationship with God has to be a two-way street where we offer ourselves to Him and He offers us the chance to be united with Him for all eternity, where He offers Himself to us. So after this exclamation, especially for our most holy, pure, blessed, and glorious Lady the Theotokos and Ever-Virgin Mary, the priest continues. We're still in the Anaphora. Same prayer. This is all one prayer. For St. John the Prophet, now we're commemorating specific saints. St. John the Prophet, forerunner and Baptist, for the holy glory and most praiseworthy apostles, for the saint of the day, whatever saint of the day goes in that spot there, whose memory we celebrate and for all your saints, through whose supplications visit us, O God. And remember all who have fallen asleep in the hope of resurrection to eternal life. And here the priest may read some names of people that have fallen asleep that he wants to pray for in this sacrifice. And grant them rest, our God, where the light of your countenance keeps watch. So we pray here for the dead because our God calls both the living and the dead to be with him in paradise. Death is no longer a permanent separation from our God as it was before the coming of Christ. So we pray for the dead because they can't pray for themselves anymore. They don't, live, they don't have a voice anymore. So we take that up for them. We carry that burden for them. And there is no greater benefit for those souls than to offer prayers on their behalf, especially at this time of the liturgy. So, we're getting close now to the end of the anaphora, to the sacrifice being completed. The priest now shifts gears and he starts commemorating the living. So the priest continues. Again we beseech you, O Lord, remember all the Orthodox bishops who rightly teach the word of your truth. So we start with the bishops, the priests, the diaconate in Christ, and every priestly and monastic order. So now we have the clergy and the monks and the nuns. Again, we offer you this spiritual worship for the whole world, for the holy Catholic and apostolic church, for those living pure and reverent lives, for civil authorities and our armed forces. Grant that they may govern in peace, Lord, so that in their tranquility, we too may live calm and serene lives in all piety and virtue. Among the first, Lord, remember our Archbishop and Father Iakovos, which is our bishop here. Grant him to your holy churches in peace, safety, honor, and health unto length of days, ready teaching the word of your truth. And it continues then in the following prayer. Also remember those whom each one of us has in mind and all your people. So we commemorated the clergy, the monks, and the nuns, the whole world, 
the armed forces and our government, that they may govern in peace and tranquility so that we can live in peace and tranquility. Our specific bishop uh, and all of us who we as a people have in mind uh, that we want to pray for. And we continue. Remember, Lord, this city in which we live and every city and country and the faithful who live in them. Remember, Lord, those who travel by land, sea, and air, the sick, the suffering, the captives, and for their salvation. Remember those who bear fruit and do good works in your holy churches and those who are mindful of the poor. And upon us all send forth your mercies. And so in the Anaphora, in the liturgy, we offer to God all of creation. We offer all, everything that he has made back to him. Father Lawrence Farley explains, and this is in, should be in your sheet, we offer our broken world back to God. We offer our broken world back to him. He will receive it as an acceptable sacrifice through Christ and will heal it. So we offer everything back to him so that he can heal us. The Eucharistic sacrifice, meaning the sacrifice of Holy Communion, therefore establishes the world and gives it peace. Meaning, if there was no church, if there was no Holy Communion and no Divine Liturgy, the world would fall apart. This is what Father Lawrence is saying. God calls us as his royal priesthood, meaning humanity, to deliver ourselves and our world into his hands. For he is the helper of the helpless, the hope of the hopeless, the savior of the storm-tossed, the haven of the voyager, and the physician of the sick. The priest finalizes the anaphora with the last exclamation, and grant that with one voice and one heart we may glorify and praise your most honorable and majestic name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, now and ever into the ages of ages. Amen. And this puts the seal on the anaphora. At this point, the sacrifice has been made, the gifts have been transformed. And we'll see as we move forward next month and in our last two sessions, this emphasis moves from making the offering and being worthy of making the offering to being worthy of receiving the offering. Because we, re we offered our offering to God and God accepted them. And now he will offer himself to us. So now the prayers you will see shift. Now accepting the offering and being worthy to accept the offering from God. We have about five minutes if there are any questions at this time. There's a lot. The anaphora is it's the gem. When we say it's the liturgy of St. John Chrysostom, it's the anaphora that is St. John Chrysostom's anaphora. When we say the liturgy of St. Basil and the prayers are very long, it's the anaphora of St. Basil. It's this portion of the liturgy that those saints wrote and those saints developed over time. Yes. yes. The first prayer of the anaphora is, uh, it is, prop, it is true, proper, and right. Yes. yes. Okay. And I, I hesitate to say the first prayer because it's all one prayer. It's the first portion of the prayer that continues on and on until the last exclamation that we just discussed. So it's all one prayer. Yes. So you talk about the gifts that we give to God in receiving Holy Communion. Is one of the gifts fasting or how, how much of an importance is fasting? When we, so the question was, one of the gifts... Is, is one of the gifts that we offer to God fasting. So when we talked about, uh, I made a reference to one of the qu uh, saints' quotes about how we have to be willing to accept the grace. Uh, let me see if I can find it again. Um, it's here. I think it was St. Nicholas Cavasilas. He says, oh, to receive the grace is a cooperation, right, between us and between us and God. So how does fasting play into that? Fasting plays into that because it's an exercise of our self-control. It's an exercise of our obedience to God as our Lord and Master. And so if fasting, in a way, is an offering to God, absolutely. Because we sacrifice something from our life that is pleasing to us for the sake of growing closer to God. And that's why many times fasting is attached to receiving Holy Communion. Of course, that comes in relationship with the spiritual father who guides you and directs you on how you should fast or not fast or whatever. You know, every person's abilities are different. So to say there's a specific fasting rule for before communion is a little bit uh, misguided. So I hope that answers your question. Is there any other questions? We have a few more minutes if there's any more questions. Going once, going twice.
Okay. God bless all of you. We'll meet again next week. And like I said, we have only two sessions left. So, God bless. Tine presvijesa kimi ton theotokon Ke prostasies ametathe ton elpidan Ta fuske nekrosist fuike kratisen Os garzo izmitera prostin zoin metes disen o mitrani kisan.